psychological self-observation. Um, we've talked about self-observation before. When we looked at the class on ego, essence, and personality, uh, one of the things that I talked about was using self-observation to try to figure out what was going on with the various egos that we carried. Um, I hint a little bit at the technique, um, and today we'll delve in a bit deeper, because it really is an important aspect of these studies. The quote for today, I love this one. If a human being says they will work on themselves tomorrow, then they will never work on themselves because there will always be a tomorrow. Right? You can substitute, if the human being says they will clean up the east drop tomorrow, then they will never clean up the east drop. I mean, it's the same idea because if it's anything they were really good at, it's procrastination. And then rationalizing afterwards why the procrastination was necessary. We're, we're pretty good like that. Um, this is a little thing to remember when you're at home and you're like, hey, you know, maybe I should put a, some time aside to meditate. Well, in a minute, I'll just I'll relax a bit more, I'll read another chapter of this book, I'll watch a program on TV, maybe I'll do the dishes, then I'll meditate. It's always later, 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 and then years, and then decades, and then, you know, lifetimes go by, and we, we really don't accomplish what it is that um, we'd set out to do. So it's a, an interesting thing to remember. Uh, our daily lives are a psychological gymnasium. Practical life is a tremendous school. Uh, remember that because of karma, a lot of things that happen to us are happening to us for a reason. They're an opportunity to learn something. They're giving us a chance to uncover an aspect of our psychology, learn from it, and better ourselves. Um, that's why all these things happen to us. That's why one of the things we talk about in Gnosis is not, hey, let's, let's dump everything, let's run away, and let's hide in a cave. Because that really doesn't accomplish anything. All these things that happen to us, the frustrations, the successes, the failures of life, they're all opportunities for us to learn. So that's why we look at our everyday life, from getting up in the morning to going to work to coming home. It's like a workout for our psychology. Just like we go to the gym to work out and perfect our bodies, life is where we go to work out and perfect our mind. That's what we're here for. That's why we're here. That's why these things keep happening to us, so we can uncover that element of our psychology, grow and develop, and ascend back up that ladder, escaping the wheel of samsara and merging back with the source. Unfortunately for us, daily life also becomes a distraction from our true purpose. See, we, and we'll look at this in depth a bit later on as well, um, what we perceive as reality is, isn't actually there. Many things that, that we see in life are simply an illusion. They're just things created by the ego which keeps us distracted from our true purpose and from our true uh, uh, task on this path. Daily life for us becomes a tremendous distraction and instead we get caught up in things like, you know, possessions and, you know, materialistic things and friends and family and co-workers and our job and we get caught up in all these things. And it's kind of unfortunate because things like our job and our possessions, even people, even friends and family, they don't last forever. These things are bound to the physical plane and, you know, a time will come when we don't have these things anymore. The greatest distraction and the barrier to inner peace and self-awareness is the ego. Okay, and that's something really important to remember. What creates the distractions, what creates the obsession with the, the material things, the houses, the cars, the jobs, the relationships, money, all that kind of stuff, where does that come from? That comes from the ego. What is it that prevents this inner peace? Why are our emotions always up and down, and our mood always side to side, and our thoughts always coming and going? Why are we always flying around all over the place? It's the ego. Why does our consciousness asleep and we're unaware of our true purpose and we don't have that, that, um, that inner happiness and that kind of stuff? That's all the ego. All esoteric work, all true esoteric work, begins with rigorous observation of oneself. Let's go right back to class one, nosite ipsum. Remember the Greeks had that phrase above the, the entrance to the temples, know thyself. All esoteric work begins with rigorous observation of oneself attention concentrated on the full observation of ourselves. What is it that we think? What is it that we feel? And what is it that we do? Because so many times we're oblivious to who we really are and the different impulses and motives that drive our everyday life. That's, that's not even esoteric stuff. A psychologist or psychiatrist would tell you that. Yet yeah, you've got your conscious mind and you've got your unconscious mind or your subconscious mind and you don't even know what's going on in there. Unfortunately, with the huge, overwhelming chunk of your mind that's, that's at the subconscious level, that's unfortunately where a lot of our motives and impulses come from. That's where our fears, that's where our desires, all this stuff stems from a side of our mind that we're completely unaware of. One of the key things on this path is we have to accept 
and proof for ourselves the doctrine of the many eyes. Now the doctrine of the many eyes, that was the Tibetan's version of the concept of the ego and the consciousness. Now up until this point, um, you, you've been you know, coming to classes, I've been talking about it a lot, we've looked at a, all kinds of different examples and scenarios involving the ego, but to really progress in this work, you have to arrive at that conclusion for yourself. Okay, it really is one of those things, you can't take my word for it. You want to experience this directly for yourselves. And I really think a key thing on the Gnostic path is whether or not people actually accomplish this. People that don't accomplish this probably don't stay on the Gnostic path too long and they you know, stop coming and they go seek out another school or another path or that kind of thing. But those people I think that can verify this, those are the ones that usually stick around to see you know, what else is going on. We have to stop believing we are a single individual and comprehend with direct observation that each desire, each thought, each action, passion, etc., 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 corresponds to one ego or another. We have to be in a situation like when we're angry or losing our temper and suddenly have that revelation that, wait a second, what is happening here? Where did this anger come from? This is not part of me. There is something else separate from that. Yes, I have that anger, or yes, I have that fear, or whatever emotions manifesting, but there's something else at the back. There's something else at the back of my mind, a little voice, a, a sense or a perception or something that tells me that I'm somehow separate from that anger. That anger isn't a part of me. It's something else. We have to attempt to separate from our psyche the diverse, undesirable elements within us. We have to start being able to delineate the difference between what is the consciousness, the higher self, the intuition, and that kind of stuff speaking or manifesting, and what is the lower forms, the fear, the depression, the anger, the jealousy, the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all these different impulses that drive our lives. Remember when I use an example like fear, um, it doesn't have to be on a conscious level, because we're all adults, we're not, we're not afraid of very many things, but fears operate on a subconscious level and impulses to do all kinds of strange things. For example, some people have a fear of being alone, and that will lead them to make very unwise decisions when it comes to relationships, as an example. That's just a way that, you know, when we talk about fear and anger and negative things like that, many people get lulled into the sense of, well, that's not me. I don't lose my temper and smash things and get in fist fights, therefore I am not angry. I'm an adult, there's nothing really frightens me, therefore I am not afraid. But the whole key to understanding is these things operate on a subconscious level. Really, we all are afraid of very many things. We all have issues with anger. It's just they manifest themselves in a different way. To an extreme, yes, fears manifest themselves as phobias and things that really affect our lives. To an extreme, yes. Um, things like anger manifest itself as people that have short tempers and become violent and abusive and that kind of thing. But it doesn't mean that, you know, that's not the case for us. We just all manifest it in a different sort of way. Self-observation, then, it is the tool we use to confirm the doctrine of the many eyes. It's the tool we use to suddenly have that revelation and start to learn to distinguish between the higher self or the consciousness and the ego. Self-observation is becoming aware and conscious of all our thoughts and actions. That's the ultimate goal. That's the point that we're trying to reach, but we have to get there a little bit at a time. So self-observation, it sounds fairly simple. Becoming aware and conscious of all our thoughts and actions. Basically, what we're thinking, what we're feeling, and what we're doing. Now remember, thinking and feeling and doing, that stems from the concept of the three brains. Remember, you can take all of humanity, you've got the thinkers, the feelers, the doers. We look at the five centers, and we can basically group them into those three categories. So our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions. So when we're fully under self-observation, if I'm you know, in a situation where I feel I'm losing my temper, self-observation then is being aware of what are the thoughts that are going through my mind in that situation, what are the emotions and feelings that are going through my mind, and what are my physical actions. Okay, because it's you know, easy to forget that we many times don't watch our physical actions and that's why we end up doing something to take into an extreme like smashing a plate or punching a wall or perhaps even hitting somebody or something like that. We've all been in similar situations where we've done something silly as a result of the thoughts and the emotions that came up in a particular situation. 
basically being aware of the manifestation of ego in the three brains. So asking ourselves, what are we thinking, what are we feeling, or what are we doing? We're just being aware of how the ego is manifesting in each of those three centers, in each of those three centers of activity. Because remember, for us, we're like a puppet that's dancing on a string. These are the strings that are pulling us, and that's how the ego enters the physical organism and controls or influences what it is that we do. In the meantime, feeding off of the intellectual energies, the emotional energies, and the motor slash instinctive slash sexual energies as well. The egos are literally taking those energies. Self-observation then is used to, to do a variety of things. The first thing self-observation helps us to do is confirm the doctrine of the many eyes. To be in a situation where perhaps we can be acting a certain way and suddenly realize what's happening. Realize how that ego is manifesting. Being in a situation and realizing, you know what? This is actually a result of, of a particular fear. I am only acting like this because I'm afraid of being alone. I don't want to be alone right now, so consequently this is happening. Okay? Or being somewhere and feeling ourselves being frustrated and angry and realizing this is only happening because of my inflated, self of, inflated sense of self-importance. I'm angry right now because I'm very important and don't these people know what they're doing? Wait a sec, I'm not so important. I'm not more important than anybody else. What's going on here? That's how self-observation works. Okay? Confirming the doctrine of the many eyes. Then discover all the various egos that we possess and how they influence and control our lives. Basically, we want to uncover those forces that are steering the ship of our life. We talked about ourselves being like a small ship tossed about on the stormy waters of the ocean. Well, we better figure out what the wind and the waves are doing and where they're trying to take us. That's what we're trying to do here. Uh, the first step in uncovering the egos is self-observation. Okay, because we have to basically see that they're there. When we self-observe them, when we identify them, then we can study them. We can see how they behave, how they influence our lives, what they try to get us to do, the different situations they put us in, the different thoughts and emotions that are generated. That's comprehension. And the third step after comprehension is elimination. So when we look at the ego as a whole, the end result is completely eliminate them, to permanently not make them a part of us. Okay, but that begins with observation, because observation then leads to comprehension. Comprehension then leads to elimination. The third thing is to discover the effects the egos have on our actions or our lives. So we have to confirm that they're there in the first place. Then we have to figure out which ones we have, and then we have to figure out what it is that they're trying to do. Okay, because all of us have different balances of egos trying to accomplish different, different things, different desires. We all have different wants and different things that we're trying to do and trying to accomplish. We have to figure out what they are, and then we have to figure out just how are these things influencing us? How are they steering us and directing the, the course of our life? <clears throat> now, when we truly and sincerely begin to observe ourselves, we end up creating a split. Now, this is really interesting. So if we sit down and say we want to really give the practice of self-observation a try, if we really want to attempt this, we're going to discover that in order to self-observe properly, we end up instantly creating a split. So in order for you to right now to say, okay, what am I thinking, what am I feeling, and what am I doing? In order to do that properly, what you discover is you create a split. You separate yourself immediately into two parts. The first part is the observer, that which is watching. Okay, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What am I doing? Now that's interesting because that, the observer, becomes the consciousness. The other part is the observed, that which is being watched, which becomes the ego. When we work with self-observation, there's a couple things that happen. We create this split. First off, what that does is immediately divert the attention to the consciousness. That's like a workout. That's like an exercise for the consciousness. Usually we don't pay any attention to this, and we pay a ton of attention to this. When we self-observe, that's like a workout for a consciousness. Every time we do it, the consciousness gets stronger and stronger and stronger. The other interesting thing that happens is when you're doing this, you're going to remain in the present moment. You're going to find yourself in the instant, not in the past, not in the future, because the consciousness belongs to the eternal instant. The consciousness is the here and now, the ego is back there and over here. Okay, that's why the ego is always trying to pull us into the past or drag us into the future. It never wants us to be here right now. That's where the consciousness lives. 
Okay, so for you to right now say, wait, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? Where am I? What's going on? What am I doing? What position do I have my body in? You're suddenly becoming aware and focused in this present moment. It snaps you out of that daydream of what you're going to do this weekend or what you did last weekend. Okay, so to self-observe, you're instantly creating a split. And this is a really interesting aspect of this because this split then allows you to focus on the consciousness. Okay, because it's the consciousness that watches the ego. The ego can't watch itself. Okay, it's not the ego watching the ego. That doesn't, that doesn't work like that. It's the consciousness, the higher part of you, watching the lower part. Okay, so that's the thing about self-observation. Not only does it allow you to observe the ego and discover it and all that kind of stuff, it literally is like you know picking up a, some weights and, and working on your arms. Over time, the consciousness gets stronger as it develops, the more you pay attention to it, the more you learn to stay in that present moment and be conscious. It's like handing the reins over. It's like handing the steering wheel of that car over to the consciousness and saying, where are we going? Okay, what's the ego doing? What's happening? So let's say in a present moment, let's say something happens that makes me angry. Okay, if I'm not self-observing, then I've identified with the ego and I'm giving into what impulses that ego has. Maybe I'm, you know, lashing out at somebody. Maybe I'm saying words that are intended to hurt somebody. Maybe I'm getting frustrated, angry, tense. My back muscles are up. I'm all, you know, stressed out. But if I'm working with self-observation in that moment, if I create that split, then I can watch these things as they start to develop, but from a different vantage point. The whole time I'm from this vantage point, I'm not identifying with this. I'm not giving into it. I can feel the impulse to, I really want to say this, or I really want to do that, but I'm not giving into it. It allows us to stay in that present moment because a normal course of action is give into the ego, you know, act, feel, say, do, whatever, and then look back on it later and go, oh, what did I do? But that's too late, right? That was after the fact. But working with self-observation allows us in a present moment like that to be conscious and not hand the reins over to the ego. Whenever we work with this, there's always a fork of the road. We go one of two ways, this way or that way. This way gets us into all kinds of problems in our life. This way doesn't, because this way allows us to make use of things like intuition and work with the higher self and that kind of stuff. So as I mentioned, the ego can observe the ego. It's the consciousness that observes it. In order for us to undergo the process of self-observation, we have to shift the attention to the consciousness, which then begins to watch the ego, which is creating a different state of mind immediately. We have to create that separation. And we'll look at uh, the impact of what that means. We have to create that separation. That attention is directed on our interior. We have to almost fold our, our attention internally. And that's something that we normally don't do. Our attention is always directed externally. We never look within. And one of the things that that's allowed us to do, by never looking within, by never paying attention to our interior, what we've done is created an image of ourself that's not very accurate. And I've mentioned this before. If we're guilty of worshipping any golden idols, it's the golden idol of a false self. We have all this... this these different preconceived notions of who we are and how we should be perceived that in many cases are, are completely inaccurate. Instead of judging ourselves and learning about ourselves, we instead judge, criticize, condemn, and observe other people, rarely ever ourselves. Okay, the whole process of self-observation, it's almost like folding your attention inward instead of outward and being aware of what you're doing, what your problem is, you know what your problem is, directing it internally. So when somebody is, you know, getting us angry instead of directing all that at them and all that anger at them because they did that, we're instead folding that attention inside to see where that emotion came from. Why is it there? Why is it manifesting? What is it trying to get us to do, to think, to feel? And it's a really interesting thing when that happens. Um, I have a funny story. I remember being in a line at Walmart. I don't like going into Walmart because it's always a difficult experience. It provides many opportunities for self-observation. Let's just put it that way. So I'm at Walmart at, at one lunch, and I'm standing in line, and it was a, a day when it was really busy. You know, I'm standing in line up, and I'm at the end, and there's a bunch of people before me. And then there's an elderly lady um, who's buying something. And uh, it's getting close to the end of my lunch, so I'm in a, you know, a little bit of a, a hurry to get back to work. And uh, obviously, everybody else in the line probably thinking the same thing. And this elderly lady, um, when the cashier says it's, you know, X amount, is the, the price for this, she pulls out the, the big bag of change, right? So out of the purse, the big bag of change comes on out. And you could watch it ripple like dominoes. The, oh, er, oh, that sense of frustration and annoyance that rippled down that, uh, that lineup. And it finally reached me. And I did that. Oh, man, it was just figure I'm like, going to be late for work. And then 
I was able to do something different. Then at that point, I was able to, okay, you know, work with self-observation and get a different perspective. And I was feeling the anger and the frustration. The question was, where did it come from? Why am I feeling that? And when you dig at it, you pay a bit of attention. What I was arriving at was the sense of, okay, this is, this is because she is going to make me late. And does she know who I am? I'm very important. I have places to do. And really, what does it matter? I'm going to be an extra minute and a half where I have to go. The poor woman is paying a change because maybe that's all the money that she has. You know, you start to see things from a different light. Everybody else in this line is annoyed. And there was another woman that was making uh, like uh, uh, comments that were inappropriate. This woman, you could see she was starting to get upset. She was starting to shake a bit. And it was just a horrible situation to watch that was created because of all the different egos in that lineup. Everybody thought they were more important than everybody else. Everybody thought that their place in the world was better or higher than this other individual. When in the end, we're all the same. It doesn't matter. There's not one person better off or worse off than the other. We're all on the same planet. We all have the same goal. And in the end, two minutes in a lineup at Walmart, what, is, what does that mean? Like, what does that really accomplish, right? And that's the idea of self-observation. So instead of you know, being all frustrated and tapping my foot and acting all annoyed as everybody else, I was able to make a different type of observation about myself and come to a, a different conclusion. And instead of radiating negativity and, and hate and all this stuff at this woman, I was then able to direct a compassion, an understanding, recognizing that that's a difficult situation to be in. Uh, fortunately, the karma, whatever, I'm not in that situation where I have to, to, to pay with change and you know kind of direct something else at her. But it's an interesting thing because working with self-observation. Okay, so we're directing our attention on our interior. That's the observer. And it's the thoughts and emotions and actions that we're watching for which becomes the observed. And if we're paying attention, if we're like alert like a sentry at a time of war, we can see these things sneaking forward. Like standing in a lab at Walmart on your lunch, if you're paying attention, you can feel these things. You can see them in other people, and you can see them manifesting in yourself as well. The whole process of self-observation is necessary in order to not identify with our egos. The mistake we've been making all our lives is we've given them to them. They've assumed they were us. When I was in that Walmart, lineup at Walmart and everybody was angry and I felt anger, then go with the anger because now I am angry. But the thing is, is who is the I? Because really the consciousness, it doesn't get angry. It doesn't feel hate. It doesn't feel frustration and impatience and fear and jealousy. And it doesn't feel those things. Those things are all associated with the ego. When we create that separation, that allows us that different perspective, that different vantage point. And that allows us to then take that fork in the road and not give in to that impulse, whether it be manifesting as a thought or an emotion or an action. If we don't identify with them, then of course we're separated from them, which is the whole concept of observe and observe. So we'll come around in full circle here. If we don't identify with them, then we can remain separated. If we remain separated, that means we can remain in the present moment. That means we can remain working with our consciousness rather than the ego. And that's the whole goal of self-observation. While we're conscious, we're able to learn things. We're able to get a different perspective on situations. We're able to arrive at a different revelation. Okay, and for me that's a silly example, but that was one of the first times that I experienced for myself the idea that many things like frustration, like anger, like impatience, they all stem from an elevated sense of, of who we are. You know, I am very important. Don't you know what you did to me? And then you can look to your behavior and you can start to see that, okay, we, we excuse actions in others, we wouldn't tolerate for, um, uh, sorry, we excuse actions in ourselves, we wouldn't tolerate for a minute in others. You know, and then a short time later after that, I find myself sitting at a red light. And, you know, people always try to turn left at the red light, and you're getting all annoyed and frustrated. A couple of light changes earlier, guess who's turning on the red light? But that's different, because it's me, because I have somewhere that I need to be, and I'm running late. Right? And then you realize, yeah, but that's what everybody thinks all the time, and that's how we get in these situations. We have to be able to see our egos as separate and distinct from ourselves. That's what we have to do to confirm the doctrine of the many eyes, to really experience some of this and realize, wait a second, that anger is different. I can, I can stop it. I don't have to go with it. And then I can analyze it. And then where did it come from anyways? Because really that's not a part of me. I don't want to be angry. I don't want to direct all this negative energy at, at, at this is poor woman. That, that's not me. That's who I am. Why am I behaving like this? We must be able to say 
looking at things that this particular, what I'm feeling right now, these thoughts are directed from the ego of pride, or this desire is caused by the ego of lust, etc., etc. We have to be able to see the things that are happening in the centers of the, of the human machine and recognize where they're coming from. Okay, so like I was standing in that line of, at, at the Walmart and, and realizing that this is actually, this, this, these feelings right now, they're being generated by anger. And what is that anger related to? Well, I'm, I'm frustrated and I'm impatient. Well, why is that? Because, because I'm very important and this person's holding me up. That doesn't even make any sense. Okay, we have to be able to confirm this for ourselves, experience this, and, and go down that path of the psychology of examining these different behaviors to see where they come from. And it's interesting because many times they don't come from where you think they do. The example there of, of, of for me with the uh, anger and the frustration, being able to arrive at the conclusion that was just because I have a, a, you know, I think too highly of myself. I think I'm more important than anybody else. I have something within me that thinks I'm better than everyone around me. Therefore, I measure, hold myself to different standards and hold you to different standards. You're not allowed to take longer than line up. You're not allowed to turn left at the red light. You're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do this because that's for me. Because I'm very important, don't you know? When we see the eagles as part of us, we identify with them. And that's what we've done our entire life. That's why we find ourselves, you know, getting angry, being depressed, being afraid, being frustrated, being anxious, being impatient, whatever. We identify with them and we see them as part of us. The problem with that is remember the whole concept of the ego is it sustains itself by feeding off the various energies that we have. So when we identify with a particular ego, like anger, we're feeding it. We let it manipulate our body so it can make use of those intellectual, emotional, and motor energies. When we identify with the ego, we strengthen them. We feed them. Okay? It's like having a you know, big dog in your backyard. The more you feed it, the bigger it gets. Okay? And we've been doing that now from lifetime to lifetime to lifetime, sustaining the same egos. Okay? And in a sense, in some cases, emotions and thoughts then become like an addiction. So we can find, for example, people that have a short temper are literally almost addicted, in a sense, to the energy associated with anger. So they find themselves manifesting it all the time. People who are addicted uh, to a negative energy like depression will find themselves being depressed all the time. Addictive is, I'm using that in a, in a different sense here, but that's what the egos are trying to do. If we have a problem with the ego of anger, it is constantly trying to manifest itself in us. So it's finding little ways for us to trigger that anger. Okay, same thing if we have a problem with fear or depression. There's all these different things that are happening in our lives that the ego wants to associate with. So when X happens, you will be depressed. Okay, or when X happens, you will be angry. And the ego uses those little triggers to generate those emotions to allow the ego to surge in and take all that energy, be it intellectual energy, emotional energy, sexual energies, or whatever. Um, examples of identifying. We might even be guilty of some of these ourselves. You know, watching a movie and crying. That's identifying with the actors and circumstances. Okay, when we identify with that, then we undergo that whole process of, of, of crying and the associated energies with that doesn't even make any sense. Why would we cry because of a movie? Those things aren't happening to us. They're not real. We all know they're actors. Why do we get scared with a horror movie? We all know it's a TV. It's not real. They're actors. It's movie sets. It's special effects. Why is it we feel that genuine emotion? And that's why this culture and this humanity loves things like movies and sports events. Why do people, you know, think of riots at soccer games and hockey, you know, like people experience that firsthand. They see that, they identify with those emotions, and they want to feed off them. And that's what, same thing with music. Okay, that's why we find these things really pervasive in our society. Music is a big deal. Movies are a big deal. Sports events are a big deal. Why? Because they allow us to artificially feed on those energies. We can sit on the couch, mindlessly watching the TV, while all these egos coming out, just feeding off of all this energy. The egos are the ones that are active, the egos are the ones that are growing, and our consciousness just sits there asleep while the uh, television screen entertains us. And some people live entire lives like that, right? So those are some examples of what happens when we identify with those egos. And we can also see situations from these examples of how the egos can associate themselves with various events and hobbies and personal circumstances that allow them to keep feeding off those particular energies. 
when we can start to separate the ego from ourselves, then we realize, and this is the interesting part, we realize that neither our thoughts, nor our actions, our wishes, our desires, whatever, emotions, we start to see that they don't belong to us. We start to see that they come from somewhere else, and we start to see that there's something different inside of us from that continuous non-stop barrage of thoughts, from those continuous emotions. We can start to see that there's something else, there's something more to us. And that's, of course, the realization of the consciousness that we carry within. Once we start to separate all those egos, we can see who we really are. And I've used this analogy before. Imagine there's a hundred people in this room screaming for our attention, and in the corner is this little child. That little child represents the consciousness. You come down those stairs, you can't even see or hear that child from all these hundreds of people screaming for our attention. But if we can go through and shut up every person and kick every person out of the room and see what's left, then we discover that child, and then because there was no distraction and no noise, we could really listen to what it has to say. The child represents the consciousness, all the other people represent the ego. Sitting there in that chair right now, you've got so many people in your head already. Different thoughts flying through your mind, different emotions, different impulses. What are you going to do when you leave here? What are you going to do on the weekend? Thinking it was Christmas almost, don't you know? What are you going to do for Christmas? All that kind of stuff. And instantly, you can see, I said Christmas right there. That created a reaction in your mind. For some people, that's a positive reaction. For other people, that's a negative reaction. You now are right now thinking about Christmas. Christmas passed, and what are you going to do? That was all a reaction to a situation. Okay, I said Christmas, that to you created a response that you would associate with your various egos that you then run through your mind. Okay, we do that 24-7 non-stop, even in our sleep, which we'll look at later on. When we start to self-observe, we will notice repetitions of events, repetitions of states of consciousness and awareness, repetitions of words, thoughts, desires that in each, that, sorry, exist in each day of our existence. We live a very mechanical existence, and we've gone through our whole life as A plus B equals C. We have these inherited behaviors, prejudices, and all kinds of stuff that exist in our psychology. Just like I said Christmas. That's part of an equation. For you, you fill in the rest. Christmas equals for you whatever it does. We're all different. We've gone through our entire life like that. Okay, what we don't notice is the pattern that exists. Psychologists and psychiatrists are aware of this, and this is one of the things that they try to do by analyzing your dreams and you know, having a sessions where they talk to you. They're trying to discover all these little triggers that you have in your life. Somebody that has a problem with depression, they're trying to discover what is the depression linked to? What causes the depression? What is the cycle that allows this depression to keep manifesting, and how can we break that? So this kind of a concept isn't even a, uh, an esoteric or a, a spiritual thing. This is just a practical aspect of our psychology. We don't necessarily need to use a psychologist or psychiatrist to discover this for ourselves. Nor do we have to wait till we've got something really wrong, like a, a severe problem like depression, before we have to start questioning the routines and the patterns in our life as well. This is something that we can do right now. This allows us to experience firsthand the level of mechanicity that governs our lives. And that's something that we really aren't aware of, how mechanical our existence becomes. And when you start paying attention, you can see that, yes, everything from your morning routine to what you do on the way to work, to what you do at work, to what you do when you come home, we have these, these mechanical things that we do over and over again. The problem with that level of mechanicity is it allows us to go on autopilot. We've drove the same route to work so many times we don't have to think about it anymore. The motor center can take over that while our mind wanders. We've washed ourselves in the shower or the bath so many times before, we don't have to think about it. So while we're in the bathtub, we're thinking about what we're going to do at work that day. When we're driving to work in the car, we're thinking about what we're going to do at work that day. When we get to work, we're thinking about what we're going to do at home that night. When we get home that night, we're thinking about what we're going to do on the weekend. We're always somewhere else. We're never in the present moment while we wander around like robots. That's why people have accidents, car accidents. That's why people walk into telephone poles and trip over things. And, and that's why we have all experienced some sort of a mistake that we've made because we weren't paying attention. We've entered the wrong numbers. We've caused ourselves some sort of a problem because we just weren't conscious. We weren't thinking. Our mind wasn't into what we were doing. Because we have that level of mechanicity which creates that complacency which allows us to you know, daydream wander. 
And it's kind of a strange thing, but our society is pushing that farther and farther. You've all heard the concept of multitasking, right, and how advantageous that is. Um, psychologists have, have done all kinds of studies to prove that we really, really, really suck at multitasking. We're not very good at it at all. It's the illusion of doing a whole lot of things when the chances of uh, error goes through the roof, productivity like decreases, there's all kinds of problems with multitasking. We just like to think that we're really good at it, when really it's something we do all the time. We're at work doing something, we're home washing the dishes, but our brain is somewhere else. We constantly do that, multitasking. Self-observation creates an awareness. That awareness activates the consciousness. Self-observation says, I have to be here in the now and pay attention. That breaks the cycle of mechanicity, which allows the consciousness to activate and come forth in that present moment. So if we're driving to work daydreaming, then we're not there, we're not conscious. But if we stop and say, what am I doing right now? What am I thinking? What am I feeling? What am I doing? In that moment, we suddenly create awareness. Like, where am I? What am I doing? I'm driving down the road. There's an intersection ahead of me right there. There's a car beside me. Creating that awareness has activated that consciousness. We've pulled ourselves back into that car to focus on our environment. Okay, many times we're completely oblivious to things around us. Okay, there's all kinds of details that we miss in our environment. There's things that we're not even aware of. We've all done this before. How many times have you been looking for something and you've looked and where's my water bottle? I don't know, I can't, where's my water bottle? Where's my water bottle? Oh, it's been here all along. Why didn't I see it before? Because you weren't consciousness. You weren't, sorry, conscious. You weren't taking in all the information. Okay, we just create many times our own reality around us and can lead to all kinds of strange behaviors as a result that we'll study later. Self-observation creates awareness. Awareness allows us to then not identify with the ego. Not identifying with the ego allows us to study it and understand it. That brings us one step towards completely elimin eliminating it from our psychology. So if we look at something, let's say we, you know, we want to eliminate anger, because let's say we have problems with anger and anger and has caused us a lot of uh, challenges in our life. Well, if we can work with self-observation and develop that awareness, if we cannot identify that anger, we can study that anger, what it's trying to, how it makes us think, how it makes us feel, how it makes us act, and eventually that gets us toward the, uh, closer to the situation, sorry, where we can eliminate that anger. We no longer have to have that as part of our psychology, which means in a situation that for us would have normally triggered anger, it simply doesn't. We don't get taken away from that moment because of the anger. We then can stay in that moment with awareness. So, how to actually go about it? How to actually self-observe? Now, the goal is to be constantly observing ourselves from moment to moment, fully aware of all the actions and aware of everything. And at that point, we would be, of course, an awakened master. That's the idea. Somebody with their consciousness awakened is fully aware, fully observing, working directly with the consciousness from moment to moment. That's the goal. Obviously, it's going to take us a, a little bit of time and practice in order to reach a state like that. That's not going to happen overnight. That's not going to happen instantly. Um, you could call this living in the now. I've heard that buzz phrase before, right? Living in the now. It's kind of a, a funny thing, but when you look behind that term, there's actually some real wisdom there. There's some gnosis behind the concept of being in the now, living in the now. Living in the instant with awareness. Being locked in the eternal instant fully aware of what's going on, activating the consciousness. That's what we're trying to do. Stay in the moment, live in the now. Okay, all those silly buzz phrases in the end, there's some gnosis there for sure because that's exactly what we're talking about. Not identifying with the ego, not being taken in the past, not being taken into the future. But like any skill, you have to start somewhere and gradually develop the ability. Okay? It is impossible to observe moment to moment without any practice. Okay? We've, got, we've got to work up to it, just like it's impossible to sit down behind the piano and pull off one of uh, Mozart's best symphonies if you've never learned to play the piano. Right? We have to start somewhere. And it's important to remember that because without that, you tend to get frustrated. Okay? As I've said before, you have to treat the Gnostic path like we're just learning how to do an instrument. Okay, then you're like six weeks into learning how to play the piano. You're still trying to figure out where all the keys go and what your fingers do. You're not playing any symphonies yet. It's important to remember that. To start the process, and we hinted about this um, when we looked at the class on the ego, essence, and personality. 
To start the process, begin by choosing a time each day or a time on certain days to self-observe. We want to equate self-observation with a regular action that we do. Okay, so something as simple, tying our shoes, getting a shower, driving to work, that would be a really good one. Because um, if people actually self-observed behind the wheel, we wouldn't have nearly half the accidents and fatalities and horrible things, which means we wouldn't pay nearly the insurance that we do, or blah, 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 but there you go. Um, it could be something as simple as whenever you leave one room and go into another room. Whatever you do, you just want to say that, you know, during my day, X equals self-observation, okay? I, I uh, took it a little bit as a step farther than that, um, and what I was able to do, because I have the opportunity, I guess you'd say, of sitting behind a computer for a large portion of my day at work. And if you're in that situation, there's something else that you can do as well. Um, I found this little utility that I could set to put reminders on my screen every whatever. I had it go off every half hour. So every half hour, no matter what I was doing on the computer, suddenly this little note would pop up and it just said SO with an exclamation mark. Self-observation. But everybody else in my office, they're like, why do you computer keep saying so? I'm like, ah, never mind. This little pop up. Um, and every time that popped up, I would stop what I was doing and say, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What am I doing? What are the thoughts in my head right now? What are the emotions? What's my general state of mind? What's happening? Where am I? What am I doing? How am I physically situated? How is my physical body? And then I would be able just to sit there for a few minutes from that state of um, consciousness. And then, of course, I'd start going back to my task, and then eventually, you know, I'd be dragged back into the world of the ego again until the next time that notice popped up. And what was really interesting is being there sitting at work with this thing going all the time, I was able to train myself to actually start self-observing. Okay, and then that leads, we'll look at this later on, that leads to a totally different state of consciousness. It's a, it leads to a, a different a level of awareness. And we'll look at that later on when we look at the four different states of consciousness because there's four different levels. And eventually working with self-observation allows us to have a glimpse at the state of consciousness that exists above the one that we experience right now. You can think of like the levels of consciousness like the different floors of a house. Okay, and you can from one floor you can kind of peek up to see what's going on in the next level. Self-observation will eventually lead us there. But pick a process. I was doing it every half an hour at work because I had the luxury to do that. That's not necessary, but it allowed me to make, because we're creatures of habit, it allowed me to make self-observation a habit. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to say, when I do this, this means I'm going to self-observe for as long as I can. Okay? So eventually, you're going to slip back into your regular state of consciousness because of the strength of the ego, but we want to start that. Could you argue that not so much the, the awareness, but huh? the living in the instant, that animals do that very well? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's one of the things that they're different with, absolutely. Yeah, an animal doesn't really have the ability to go into the past or the future like that. They're kind of always in a different state of mind already. Yeah. <coughs> I have a theory, too, on cats and astral projection. I saw my cat when I said an astral projection. I think cats sleep half the time, because I think that half the time they're asleep or wandering around somewhere else. It's a funny story, and it sounds really bizarre, but I was astral projecting in my house, walking down my hallway, and I ran into the cat. It's like a totally strange thing to say. I didn't like cats, and I bought this house, and it came with a cat. It was a cat that the previous owners had been feeding. And uh, I didn't really like, I didn't want to mess with animals and litter boxes and that kind of stuff. But this cat ended up in my house. It kind of weaseled its way in, and I was letting this cat live with me. And I kind of, ah, cats are kind of, I didn't get cats. And, you know, the ancient Egyptians were here cats, and cats have weren't worked their way into folklore. And all, anything to do with, you know, magic and the occult and whatever, they've always been the cats. I never understood that until one day I'm after projecting my house and I ran into the damn cat that looked at me in the eye and walked up. And I thought, she's sneaky or <laughs> So that's my theory on cats is I think that's why they sleep most of the time that they do is they're switching to another place and then they come back. I wish you could have had a conversation with it and asked it, were you really there? But you know, it didn't act any different. It's kind of like, oh, you figured out into this too, huh? And just kind of walked away. And I was like, was that the cat? What's going on? And it was, it was like, different time. Uh, the easiest way to begin is to observe all those mechanicals, or sorry, all the mechanical reaction habits when facing all the small mundane details at work at home. You know what? Because you, to be honest with you, you could want to self-observe when you're angry or when you're, when you're afraid, but those emotions and impulses are so strong, it's really hard to stay in the present moment when you're angry if you're not used to self-observing. 
Okay? Yes, we want to try to self-observe when we're angry, when we're afraid, and that kind of stuff, but we need to get some practice, because those are strong emotions. Okay? Those are strong emotions which generate some powerful thoughts and all kinds of stuff. You're going to have a really hard time if that's just what you're going to try to do. But if you've got some practice, then, and you've developed that consciousness a bit, then it'll be easier when that anger manifests or when that fear manifests. Okay? That's why the best way to start is those regular mundane things. Getting a sh having a shower, washing the dishes, tying your shoes, driving to work, because there's, it's fairly simple to self-observe for short periods of time on something mundane. But by doing that, you're strengthening that sense so when that anger does manifest, you stand a greater mm -hmm. chance of being able to self-observe. And over time, that ability grows and grows and grows. Okay, so we picked the obvious ones, getting ready for work in the morning. Anything that you find, you know, boring that you go on autopilot for. Driving to work, depending on what your work day is. Everybody has something they do, no matter what they do at work, that, you know, they, they just go on autopilot for. You want to basically, at this point, associate self-observation with something. So when I'm doing this, self-observation happens. For me, I had a hard time remembering to do that, so I had my computer tell me. Every half hour, it told me to self-observe. And sometimes I wouldn't be at my computer, but I'd come back, sit down, and the thing would be flashing on the screen. So I'd be, oh, as soon as I saw it, I'd self-observe self and then go back to whatever that I was doing. Remember, when you're doing this, to put your focus and attention on the moment and task at hand. That's really all that you're doing. Okay, I'm, the thing would flash on my computer. What am I feeling? What am I thinking? What am I doing? What were the thoughts that were just going through my mind? Where did those thoughts come from? This is a chance to analyze yourself. And then after you've done that, go back to your task, in this case, random tapping on the computer, but try to stay aware for as long as you can before those thoughts, those daydreams, those fantasies come back in and then take you out of the present moment. Okay, so you wanna stay in the moment. As silly as that sounds, washing the dishes. Say, okay, now I'm gonna grab the plate, I'm gonna rinse it with the sponge, rinse it in the tap, put it in the rack. Now I'm gonna get the next plate and not be distracted. Be right there washing the dishes. Don't be thinking about the weekend or Christmas or whatever. Silly as that sounds, be there washing the dishes. Because while you're washing the dishes, fully aware of what you're doing, you're flexing the consciousness. It's like a workout for the consciousness. So over time, it's going to grow and it's going to develop. And that silly little mundane thing of just being conscious while you're washing the dishes can then feed that consciousness enough so when that anger manifests later on, you're able to retain control. You're able to stay in the present moment, not identify with the anger, and allow it to take your life wherever it wanted to go. Okay, don't let the egos distract us. No automatic actions and thought. Everything should be deliberate and conscious. Okay, not just simply reaching for things because that's what we always do, or doing things that's what, because that's the way we always do them. Make everything that we do conscious. That's one of the things that we do in meditation, when we focus on our breath. And I just say, okay, now I'm just going to focus on our breathing for a while, or focusing on our heartbeat. These are things that we do automatically, and instead we're turning them into conscious actions. Okay, so we don't think about your breathing, but in a meditation, when you sit down and focus on your breathing, that's a type of almost self-observation. You're using your breathing to hold you in the present moment. You're directing your attention on that and not thinking about what time the meditation is going to be done and what you're going to do when you get home and what you're going to do at work tomorrow and what you're going to do on the weekend and it's almost Christmas and all that stuff. Okay, living in the moment, do only what you are doing. So not caught up with, with any fantasies, any daydreams or anything else like that. The goal is to start acting consciously during a tiny portion of the day. Just a little bit, just a couple times a day. Okay? And then from that point, we can work up to larger things. And this is a quote from Master Sun Al regarding the whole process of self-observation, just working with a little bit during each day. A single moment in which one is conscious and stops being a machine by choice will radically modify many disagreeable circumstances. Okay? So that becomes a launch pad for all kinds of revelations and things. So just simply deciding to self-observe while we wash the dishes, while we tie our shoes, while we drive to work, whatever it is that we do, that will end up leading to a point where we can radically modify many of the circumstances in our life. Because by strengthening that consciousness and developing this sense, 
later on, it'll allow us to see a fork in the road at situations when we would be angry or afraid or envious or whatever the particular circumstance. The worst circumstances of life, the most difficult times, offer the best opportunities for inner discovery and self-observation. Okay, life's a tremendous psychological gymnasium and many of the most difficult challenges, many of the negative things that happen to us, they offer us the best opportunities for inner discovery and self-observation. Okay, that's a, it's a, a difficult place to get to, but if we don't identify with those situations, we'll discover with astonishment eyes that we didn't even suspect existed. Okay, and understanding those egos then allows us to understand and start to work with karma as well, because many of the really difficult circumstances that happen to us are karmic, okay? Caused by very specific egos that we carry within that we're usually not even aware about, okay? So a lot of times the most challenging circumstances we have in our lives, they offer the best opportunities for inner discovery, okay? They're usually more of the most difficult ones to study, especially if you haven't tried to develop that sense, okay? Because many times the difficult circumstances in our lives they're caused by the most problematic egos that we have. Um, we all probably know somebody in our lives that uh, has problems because they can't control their temper. They create all kinds of difficult situations due to that. It's obvious to everyone around them that their temper is a problem. For those people, they're really aware of that. Okay? Same thing with people that are addicted to various substances, be addicted to alcohol or addicted to drugs. If you ever know anyone in that situation, it's really difficult to watch because it's so plainly obvious to you and everyone around them that they're doing all this damage to themselves and those around them. They don't have that same perspective because they're under the influence of that particular ego. Okay? So that's why if you look at the difficult circumstances that happen to us, if we really study them and try to self-observe in those moments, we can discover some of the most problematic egos that we carry that many times are completely um, transparent to us. We don't even see that they're there and realize the control and influence they're exerting on our lives. Okay? For example, if you find someone that has a problem with anger, if you talk to them, you'll discover that their anger is always justified. It's not them that's a problem, it's the guy that cut them off. It's the woman in the lineup at Walmart. It's the gas company, it's the HST, it's whatever. There's always some reason why they're angry and they feel just very justified in that because they don't even aware of the, they're not even aware of the mechanics of anger and the associated egos. If we're able to self-identify, or sorry, self-observe in those situations to prevent us from identifying, then it's a different vantage point. We can arrive at a different conclusion. Our most difficult moments offer us the best opportunity to discover the most conspicuous defects. The conspicuous defects are the ones that cause us the most problems. The conspicuous defects, those are the ones that are exerting some serious influence on our life. These are the ones that we urgently need to comprehend as they cause us the most problems. We all carry a lot of egos within, but we all, and this is a, a unique thing for each person, have some egos that manifest more than others have some egos that are stronger because we've been feeding them lifetime to lifetime more than others. We can usually spot these in other people, but very rarely can we spot these in ourselves. So we can look at it, we can analyze our co-workers and our friends and our family and we can you know, see what's wrong with them and why they're doing this and why they're doing that and if they'd only realize or if they'd just see and you know, we can do that easily with other people, we never do that with ourselves. Yes? Can you just... Um Remind us what the, uh, the egos are again, there's five of them? Uh, it, the best way to look at the egos is what Christianity gave us with the seven deadly sins. All right, the seven, okay. Yeah, you can look yeah. at them as like the, the heads and then they all branch out. So okay. for example, under something like, uh, um, <clears throat> like if you look at anger, we'd find all different things associated with violence under anger as an example. So you think of the seven deadly sins as like the, the generals and they each have a, an army underneath. <laughs> <clears throat> now, to know when to observe are different, okay? So there's self-observation, and that's different from just knowing something. Many people confuse observation of oneself with knowing oneself. I can say, well, look, I know I can lose my temper sometimes. I know sometimes I tend to get a little angry. Or, I know sometimes I drink a bit too much. 
And I know that sometimes I do this. We all can know things about ourselves. I'm not, when I talk about self-observation, when we discuss self-observation, I'm not talking about simply knowing. It's not good enough to say, yeah, I know, sometimes I get a bit angry, or yeah, I know, sometimes I get a bit depressed, or yeah, I know, sometimes I don't have a lot of self-confidence, or yeah, I know, sometimes I do this, or sometimes I do that. I'm not talking about knowing, because observing and knowing are two completely different things, and we want to make sure we don't confuse those. Knowing is passive and mechanical. It doesn't allow us to change anything. Yeah, I know I get angry. That doesn't help me at the time I am angry, okay? Observing, on the other hand, observing is active and consciousness, or sorry, active and conscious. To say, yeah, I know I get angry is not the same as being angry and fully aware of what's happening. To say, yeah, I know, sometimes I don't have a lot of confidence in what I'm doing is not the same as being in a moment and being aware of what's happening, and being able to just see what that lack of self-confidence is doing. Okay, knowing is a passive and mechanical process. Observing is active and conscious. This doesn't change anything. This leads to a change. Okay, to say, yeah, I know I get angry. What does that mean? Nothing. I just know that I do it. I'm going to keep doing it, but I know that I'm doing it. I don't want to do it, but I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> okay, simply knowing doesn't change anything. Most people know uh, if they have a problem with anger that they get angry. Most people who are alcoholics know that they probably shouldn't drink as much and know that they drink too much. That doesn't really change anything. It's not that you, until they can see that, that situation. Um, this is an interesting thing too, just, just talking about um, people that drink too much. Uh, for many people that um, drink too much, one of the sobering thoughts that can lead them down the path to accepting that they've got a problem is seeing themselves on video. If they've ever, if they um, have like a, you know, um, there's like an office party or a Christmas party or a wedding and they see what they're doing when they're the influence on a video they can have a I can't believe I'm actually doing that. It's a different type of awareness. Not saying, yeah, I know some of them are doing too much or sometimes they get a bit carried away, but seeing themselves doing it many times can trigger a different type of awareness where they're I gotta do something about that. So knowing doesn't really do anything. So we can know in a given moment that we're angry, but this, this does not mean we're observing the ego of anger. So I can say, yeah, I know, I lost my temper. But that doesn't mean that I learned anything. That doesn't mean I made any observations. That doesn't mean that I was able to create that split, that separation. Okay, because knowing is usually after the fact. Okay, we need to create that split between observer and observed, and knowing doesn't do that. Knowing is allows us to see you know, the after effects. It's like going into a room after the fight's been over and seeing all the smashed furniture and going, yeah, I know, I guess, it, uh, I guess it was a fight in here. That's not the same as being there, seeing it, and observe what happens. This is observing. What caused the ego? And that sounds like an easy question, but many times that can lead to all kinds of places you wouldn't even imagine. Okay? What caused the ego of anger? What thoughts are created? How does it make us act? How does it make us feel? What, changed has it, what changes or change has it produced in our personality? How is it affecting our relationship with the exterior world? What habits does it create? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is observing. So there I am standing in the lineup of Walmart. It's a silly story, but there I am standing in the lineup of Walmart, and I feel that sense of frustration when that bag of change comes out. This is the type of thing that you go down, well, why am I feeling that frustration? What is actually happening? What am I doing? What, what's my... This was my body language. I'm like, what, what's the, what am I doing? Why am I doing that? Loosen up. Like, what am I doing? scowling at this old lady for? I, well, what is, that's, why? I don't want to do this. I don't want to direct this at another human being. Like, why, why am I doing this? What kind of karma am I accruing for myself by having, making a person feel ashamed or feel embarrassed? I mean, what is happening here? I'm standing in line for a Walmart. This is silly. This is, what's going on? That was all created from these types of questions. To get back to my work and go, wow, yeah, I know, I was pretty mad in that line at Walmart. Whew, that was crazy. Well, that doesn't that doesn't allow me to reach any revelation. But in the present moment, being conscious, instead of identifying with that impulse, I'm analyzing myself. I'm asking what's happening here. Okay, if I'm angry, if, if you say something to me and I react and I go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm feeling angry. Why? Well, because he's insulted me. What, what did he say? He said he didn't like uh, didn't like my hair. Well. Why do, I, why do I really care? Why, 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 why is that bothering me? And then you start, you know, looking into what's actually going on with your psychology rather than simply A plus B equals C. 
Many of our thoughts and many of our emotions, as calculated as that sounds, are just like that. It's like a math equation, A plus B equals C. You know, being in a rush to get back to work, you know, old lady would change at Walmart equals anger, frustration. Okay, somebody cuts me off in a car, that equals anger, frustration. Why? I don't know, because it always has. And many times you look at that equation and you go, why does this equation happen? And you're like, I really don't know. It's just always been like that. When this has happened, I've always reacted like this. I really don't know why. And it allows you to realize how silly and absurd many of the things that we do in life actually are. We just have always reacted that way because we don't know. Because we learned it by watching other people that that's how you're supposed to respond. Maybe we get frustrated when people cut us off because our father used to do that when we were in the car. And he used to lay on the horn and give him the middle finger salute. So that's what we do now because I don't know. Because that's what it seemed appropriate to do. We have to start questioning that kind of stuff. Because in the end, all this is the, you know, the energy that we're directing on the world that in the end is going to reflect back to us in the form of karma. So when I talk about observing or self-observation, this is the kind of stuff. Not looking after the fact and going, wow, I guess I was this way, or I must have been like that, or I suppose this was happening, but being there in the moment. Because if you're being there in the moment asking these questions, you're working with a consciousness, which while you're asking these questions is stopping this from manifesting. So while you're asking this, the anger isn't able to manifest and make you say the things that we wanted you to say or act the way that you wanted you to say. Okay, or do whatever it was you were going to do. Instead, you're, you're producing a different state of consciousness which is giving you a different course of action. You know, we have to be aware of what does this ego want anyway? What is it trying to say? What is it, why does it manifest in the first place? What is it actually doing? What is the force that it's directing at me here? What particular route does it want me to take and why? Because many times the ego is just sustaining itself. It just wants to feed off those energies. It wants you angry so your body will release all those chemicals and all kinds of physical things will happen and all these energies will be generated so it can literally feed on them. Okay, but of course it's your consciousness that suffers for that. <clears throat> we have to use awareness to study the ego, not the mind. Awareness comes from doing and observing, not simply thinking and analyzing. Self-observation is doing and observing, Knowing is related with thinking and analyzing. I guess sometimes I do this or sometimes I do that because there's once this time that I did this and then this happened. That's thinking and analyzing. We want to come from the vantage point of awareness, the present moment, being fully aware of what's happening, not from looking after the fact and thinking, yeah, I guess I shouldn't have done this or I shouldn't have done that. We want to be in that present moment. Remember in the end, a lot of what we do, thinking and analyzing, that's just various egos choosing the intellectual center. And that's why thinking and analyzing and knowing don't need any real change or revelation many times when it comes to observing the ego is because that's just the ego. And you look for the ego is not going to observe itself because it's trying to sustain itself. It doesn't want you to know that it's there and want you to prevent it from coming. So if you're working with the ego, you're already identified with the ego and that's not going to go anywhere. Because of the whole concept of, of the ego, we live in a very small part of ourselves. We're only aware of our small part of our psychology, and that's a difficult situation to be in. You can say, okay, right now, what am I thinking, what am I feeling, what am I doing? And we're only really aware of a small part of ourselves. Our consciousness only extends to a very small area. It's like being in a big dark room with a small tiny candle. That little bit of consciousness we have can only illuminate a small area. That allows all the egos to hide in the subconscious. By working with self-observation, we're slowly making that light shine brighter and brighter and brighter, extending that consciousness, extending that awareness of the self to a greater and greater degree. And as we make that light shine brighter and brighter, we can start to see more things in the room. We start to see more things about ourselves. We start to learn more about ourselves. The end goal being make that light shine so bright that there are no dark corners left for the ego to hide. We've been able to, to you know, root it out and find it everywhere and eliminate it. The goal of self-observation is to widen our consciousness regarding ourselves. Nasate ipso. Okay, know thyself. And that begins with a simple task. It just begins with self-observation. That's why you're going to get so sick of hearing me talk about self-observation. 
And my answer to a lot of questions that you'll be asking will be self-observation. You're going to get sick of hearing that. But that's where it starts, because that's the only way we're going to end up at any real point of revelation is by working with this technique. Okay, Nasateyips, and that's what it comes to. How are we going to know ourselves? By observing ourselves. Okay, catching ourselves in the various moments. How do we start to do that? By attaching that concept with regular mundane things, small little things that we do every day. This means I'm going to self-observe now. And each day we self-observe a couple of times. But it's just like a workout. When you lose a lot of weight or be a huge muscle man, you're not going to do it in a day, but a little bit of work spread over a long period of time will bring you those results. And it's the same thing. Ideally, we want to be self-observing and be in the present moment when those really challenging moments of life come to us. But if we're not prepared for them, if we haven't been working out, then we're not prepared for the battle. So if we can start every day with a little bit of self-observation, when we have a difficult circumstance in our life arise with a really strong ego, something like anger or, or um, something like depression or fear or something like that, if we've been working out, then we're prepared for the battle. But if we haven't been working out, then we're probably not going to be able to win that one. Okay, we have to learn to discover that unknown and unconscious side. We're going to talk a bit about that next week. Because next week's class is the hidden side of our psychology. So we'll talk more about how we can delve into the, the subconscious and see what's going there. Um, sorry, see what's going on there. Because there's so much of ourselves that we're not even aware of as far as impulses and motives and all that kind of stuff. And we have to arrive at a situation where we become conscious of those things as well. <clears throat> One of the last things we'll talk about is looking at how the ego manages to get the consciousness into that sleep state. There's a three-step process we like to, to remember in Gnosis, and that's identification, fascination, and sleep. The profound sleep in which humanity lives is caused because we, number one, identify with our egos, we see them as part of ourselves. Okay? After we identify with the ego, we become fascinated. Okay? We forget ourselves and become distracted. The third step after that is, of course, the consciousness sleeps. Um, I've used this analogy before, too. It's one of my favorite ones. Life is like a hallway. All you got to do is walk from one side down to the other. There's a door at the end of the hallway, and that's what we're supposed to do. That's our purpose in life. But along that hallway, there's all these TVs. And what we do is we stop, we see a TV, we look at it, we sit down, we watch the TV. Forget where we were supposed to go. Okay? That's the whole process of identification, fascination, and sleep. An ego creates a thought or an image in our mind. We then identify with that. For example, I used the uh, funny example earlier of Christmas. I said the word Christmas, that created a reaction. You identify with Christmas. You identify with Christmas very visible. <laughs> and that was an identification. And then we become fascinated. Fascinated is the process of the fantasies, the memories, the planning, the whatever is created by that thought. So you think, oh, Chris, oh Christmas, oh man, I'm going to have to. That's the fascination. Okay? The ego plants the trigger for you to identify. The image on the screen in your mind or the thought enters your mind. Okay? That's like the bait. Okay? Then you grab the bait and become fascinated with it. While you're fascinated with it, you're feeding and sustaining that ego. For example, the, alco the alcoholic becomes fascinated by drinking bars and his drinking companions, as, a, as an example. The vain woman becomes fascinated by her appearance. She's constantly identifying with all those egos related to how she looks and the purchases and things she needs to do with makeup and all that kind of stuff. The rich become fascinated by money and possessions. So these are things that they constantly think about, things they constantly strive for. Their psychology, you'd see a ton of egos planning all kinds of baits related to that stuff. And these you think of as, as negative, you are, you know, alcoholic is bad and vain is bad and, you know, rich isn't so great either. But then you forget that we can be fascinated with all kinds of things. The honest worker is fascinated by a hard day's work, as an example. It doesn't have to be negative. Okay, remember, when we look at the ego just as negative, we tend to do that so we can exclude ourselves from it. Well, he keeps talking, anger, I don't get angry, I don't... You know, hit people, and he talks about lust, but I'm in a monogamous relationship. I don't have a problem with lust, and I don't have a problem with drinking too much, and I'm really not afraid of anything. There's a real danger that we look at all this stuff and go, well, that's not me. It must be, it's probably these other people in the room, but it's not me. But we can become fascinated 
by many things. They don't have to be negative. They don't have to be you know, bad or problematic like you know alcohol or drugs or something like that or anger. There's all kinds of things that fascinate us. Like the silly example of Christmas. It's a trigger that we react to. Our thoughts and our feelings many times are simply reactions to circumstances outside of our control. Okay, I said Christmas, you reacted to it. That's either a pleasant thing or a negative thing based on your experience that created a reaction in you that you then became fascinated with. It was just a response to something that was there. Fascinations are the things in life which distract and consume us and prevent us from seeing our real purpose. And we're all different for everybody. We all have our different distractions. These are the things which we think about. These are the things which we do that take us away from the present moment, that take us away from that consciousness and keep us in that profound sleep state. Okay, Keep us in that lower state of being. Because that's the problem with being uh, unconscious is it's a lower state of being. It's a very low state of consciousness. And from that vantage point, we can't see many things. We can't experience many things. From the low state we find ourselves in, we can't experience reality, we can't experience the truth. So we go around walking in a, in, a, in a daydream all the time. What we're trying to do is elevate our level of consciousness to a different state, allowing us to perceive more of the reality around us. Yes? So, ultimately the real purpose is to uh, reconnect to uh, the source. Mm -hmm. And um, anything distracting from that purpose should uh, should be discarded, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, such as family, <laughs> such as all other well, things. Well, we'll talk a little, we'll talk a little about that later on because um, many times and this gets a little bit difficult, especially at this point to consider. Many times the people around us, we we have attachments to, right? And what we have to just remember is, is we, this is, it sounds like a negative thing to say. It's, it's difficult, obviously, it's a sensitive subject as well. They don't, they're just belonging to this physical world, right? So yes, we can become attached to cars, but we can also become attached to people in the same sort of a sense. Um, uh, men especially can take this to an extreme and, and they can treat women and their spouses as if they were possession. It really kind of relates to that idea. But we can do that with our significant other as well. We can become attached to them in the physical sense and not develop and grow with them in the spiritual sense. And we can look, we're going to look at later on how we can take the relationships that we have in this world and how we can elevate them to a, to a different level as well. Because many of the relationships that we have with people are just ego-driven relationships. The connections we have with people are experienced many times on an egoic level, not on the spiritual or not on a higher level. So that's kind of leading into to what you were talking about. So yeah, sometimes uh, our co-workers are a distraction, families are a distraction, things like children can be a distraction if we keep everything on that lower level. There's a way to change that though, and that's what we're trying to do, to make that connection something more than a simple an egoic connection, but strengthen it on a different level where it in fact doesn't become a distraction, it becomes a strength. It becomes something that, that can help us. Yes. So you'd say rather than to abandon your uh, things that you feel are burdens to your e or creating egos, you would try to turn what <coughs> is giving you, or feeding your egos into the other direction, right? You bet. Yeah, remember everything that happens to us. So you say, okay, well, that my job is just a distraction, and my family's a distraction, and my significant other's a distraction, my kids' a distraction, I gotta cut them all loose. <laughs> Remember <laughs> that those things, that job, that family, those children, they're all serving a purpose. We're all serving a purpose for each other. They're all opportunities to grow and develop spiritually. So the things that happen between parent and child is an opportunity for both the parent and child to develop. The things that happen between co-workers, the things that happen between our significant other. So it's a fine line to tread between, okay, what's the distraction awakening consciousness and what's abandoning, what's running away, and what's avoiding. Because, yeah, first thinking, okay, well, everything else is a distraction. This is all just a distraction, so I should leave all of this. And there are religions that have, or religions or spiritual paths that have taken that um, unfortunate approach, where they've gone so far as to say to be truly spiritual, you've got to get rid of it all. 
Get rid of your family. Get rid of your friends. Get rid of your job. Get rid of your possessions. Dump all of it because it all means nothing and it's all distraction to the true purpose. But that's one extreme and that's, that's missed the whole idea that we have to experience the things that we have we're experiencing karmically. So the family that we have, there's things that we have to learn from them, there's situations, there's circumstances that arise that we have to self-observe, to discover an ego, to eliminate that ego, to change the karma, and to change the lives of those around us. You can't simply just walk away from all of that, because then you're just doomed to repeat it the next life. Okay, many times we've been doing that time and time and again, we have to actively engage the circumstances around us so we can self-observe and use these opportunities. And it sounds like kind of a selfish thing, but remember, you know, Gandhi, be the change that you want to see in the world. By changing yourself, you change other people around you. So at first it sounds like, well, you've got to self-observe and be in the moment, and your family and your friends are there for self-observing, which is some kind of selfish tool. That's not necessarily the case either. Because I think of a situation between two people that are going to be angry and that are going to fight, anger, it needs two sides. If you're trying to be angry with me, but I'm not going to be angry back, then you're not, your ego is not going to feed on my ego and exchange that energy back and forth and escalate the entire situation. So me choosing not to identify with that anger, that's just change, change something in you as well. Okay, so it sounds a little at first like it's almost like a selfish thing, like this whole world, you're all just here so I can perfect myself. It sounds a little like that at first, but if you look a bit beyond that, it's not. It's all about nasateyops and knowing myself, being the change that you want to see, which then reflects in those around us. We then change the different types of energies and the influence that we have on the world, which then starts improving the lives of those around us as well. Okay, get back here. We carry out the same fascinations during sleep. This is interesting. This process never ends. We live in the internal worlds like we do in the physical. So when we go to sleep, that daydream just continues on in the interior. So the daydreams that we have during the day, everything that we think, the fantasies, they become the reality that we experience at night. We've all done this, had something on our mind when we fell asleep and ended up dreaming about it. We've all done that. Those fascinations that we have during the day, they become the reality that we experience in the astral at night. The internal worlds, that's a, an analogy for the astral. We'll look at this later on. We'll look at the, uh, the class on dream yoga, which is coming up in two weeks, I believe. Uh, when you go to sleep at night, you're in the astral. That's where you are. And the difference between the astral and the physical is the astral conforms to your thoughts. The reality you perceive in the astral, you, basically your thoughts become reality there. Um, and it takes some practice to discern you know, your thoughts and your own projections from the true material of the astral plane, and we'll look at that later on. Studying our dreams, consequently, can tell us a lot about the hidden side of ourselves. Okay, and the self-observation and being aware of ourselves, we want to extend, we'll look at this later on, we want to extend that into the process of dreaming as well. And looking at our dreams, and we'll talk later on about keeping a dream diary and that kind of stuff, we can learn a lot about our psychology from our dreams. Because many times egos that we don't see manifesting in our day-to-day -day life, we can catch manifesting in our dreams. We can discover that they're there. Um, I, I know somebody, this is actually somebody that I work with, uh, he's a very laid back, very, you know, calm kind of person. If you met him, he'd say he's a nice guy, he's, you know, he's cool, he's collected and that kind of stuff. But his dreams <clears throat> are all uh, violent and angry and all this other stuff. So you'd see this guy and he's, he says, I never, I, nothing bothers me, man. I, you know, I'm relaxed, just chill, nothing bothers me, I'm calm. Why get angry? Why get upset? And so he's convinced he doesn't get angry and get upset. And if you knew him, he'd convince, hey, this guy doesn't get angry, doesn't get upset. Well, you should hear when he starts talking about what he dreams about. Running around shopping malls with a machete and stuff like that. It's like, man, you got some, you, it's anger. <laughs> well, so what? I'm like, well, it's just, it's manifesting to a different level. It's, you won't let it manifest during the day, so it's manifesting at night. It's still there, you know? So we'll look at that later on as well. Any more questions? So, uh, specifically with uh, self-observation, the idea is always the present mm -hmm. and not the past. So, to try to self-observe something that's already happened in the past would be essentially uh, pointless. Because yeah, that's that's thinking, and it's not entirely pointless in that you can think, okay, well, you know, what that bad situation that happened, okay, well. I guess it happened because I lost my temper, so I'm going to have to really pay attention to manifestations of anger when they occur. You could use it in that extent, but 
for any kind of real change or revelation, it won't come because that's just like a thinking and analyzing right. process. But it's not a complete waste of time. Um, I can think of instances when I've done that in my life, looked at a situation when I really didn't like the way that happened. How did I end up in that? And you think, okay, well, I think it was related to blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to see if I can catch that next time that happens. So it's not entirely, it's not a, a negative thing. Um, and it's also something that you can do actually in meditation. We'll do this in a few weeks. But you can um, go into meditation and look at a situation and try to extract some of that out of it that way as well. Just go into meditation on a difficult circumstance and try to look at it from a different perspective to s try to s get a sense of the evil that was manifesting and what it did and how it influenced the decision and everything. Okay, let's take our five minute break and then we'll do our meditation.